over 2.3 billion millennials, individuals born after 1981, constitute the world's population today. And the jury is out on whether they represent a demographic dividend or a social and economic nightmare. Since India is home to one of the largest populations of young people in the world, both the opportunity and the threat are both immense. 300 million Indian youth will enter the workforce in the next 10 years. Where are the jobs going to come from? Is what our panel on reaping the demographic dividend, ensuring jobs for Indian youth will focus on today. We have some really esteemed panelists for this session. Our moderator for this session is Mr. Murli Dhar Rao, CEO, Future Learning and Future Sharp Skills. Our panelists for this session are Mr. Dilip Chinoy, Managing Director and CEO of National Skill Development Corporation, Mr. Manish Sabarwal, CEO of Team Lease, Sanjay Bell, President, NIIT Skill Building Solutions. Murli, we look forward to a very exciting discussion. Good morning, everybody. I think three things uh, make for an explosive cocktail. Number one is a topic or a challenge that we are facing as an economy, which was uh, succinctly put just before the session started. The second is a set of panelists who have the following characteristics. One is, of course, tremendous experience. Second is passion uh, and dedication. And of course, uh, the panelists are not short of words or uh, not short of expressing them in a forum like this. The third part, of course, is you, uh, uh, dear participants. So we are expecting that you would be able to challenge the panelists with your questions and uh, with your observations or insights or uh, with uh, remarks which will need inputs and uh, responses from the panelists. So with these three things, let me just get started with the session. I'd like each of my panel members to uh, say, uh, take three or four minutes and talk about their perspective and their take on the whole thing. The panel is well represented. We have facilitators. Uh, we have uh, industry as well as the supply side. All three are represented on this panel. So without taking much of your time, I'd like to invite Dilip to talk about the role that NSDC is playing. Over to you, Dilip. Thank you, Murli, and good morning, uh, everyone. So the, the topic was like where the job is going to come from. Um, I, you know, it is very fascinating that today we actually sit and talk about where the jobs are going to come from. Because precisely about two and a half years ago, or actually three years ago now, industry had a total different take on this. Uh, they told the Prime Minister that, look, we have a problem. We uh, don't have people to employ. So there were jobs and no employable people. Second, they said that whatever the current system is producing, we can't employ. So you know, you hear this statement many times that only 20% of the engineering graduates are employable by members of NASCOM, et cetera. And the third thing what they said was that there's, there's no role that industry can play in the whole ecosystem because industry has been shut out and there's nothing can be done. So interestingly, at that point of time, and I suspect it was influenced uh, significantly by the late Professor C.K. Prahlad, uh, you know, if you're a good politician and if industry is uh, uh, coming to you with problems, uh, there's a solution that industry can drive. So best is to leave the solution in the hands of industry. And so they, uh, you know, they actually first tried to verify the facts. Uh, you know, they said, uh, what's the skilling capacity in India? And they came up in that time in 2000. Eight, nine, that India has a skilling capacity of about 3.1 million people. And actually 12.8 million people joined the workforce. So the first thing of there are no adequate, not enough adequately skilled people in the system was proved correct. The second thing was that, you know, it was very clear that only, you know, when they, when they did the experiment, when they did the actual verification of the numbers that could be employed, 20% was the upper limit in engineering. And if you went to the other things, it was 3 to 4%. And they found that actually industry had no role. So they also found that the whole thing was totally divided among 23 ministries or 17 major ministries and others in the peripheral. So what was decided was to actually align and get everyone together. And the prime minister himself decided to head the prime minister's national council on skill development and set up a coordinating mechanism within the 17 uh, ministries, uh, which is the national skill coordination board. 
and they decided that uh, you know if you do the demographic numbers and this is the question that we are all trying to answer that about 2022 and the first question why 2022 2022 was when India is 75 at that time when this was debated India had just turned 60 so we said when India is 75 years young what should you know what would its population look like and what would the workforce look like so it's estimated that there would be 700 people, million people in the working population. And if they did everything right, there would 200 million would be graduates. So that left the question that there are 500 million people now who are neither graduates, have dropped out at various levels, and they need to be skilled to get a job. So they said, let's, let's you know, give industry the option of skilling one third of them. And they, gave, they set up NSDC, which is a public-private partnership to skill 150 million people between 2008 and 2022. And they said that you know, it will be private sector driven. Private sector will have majority uh, shareholding. We will give them, uh, we'll set up a national skill development fund, which will get multilateral, bilateral government and private sector funding. And therefore, NSDC was created. Uh, at that point of time, the thought was that NSDC would actually create this huge you know, network of training institutions around the country we would most probably employ two million people at the end of the thing, and we, we chose to do differently. At that point of time, luckily, I was not the CEO of NSDC, but I was on the board. And we said, this is not going to work. So we said, what's going to work is if we can get entrepreneurs, and there are many of you in this room, and in fact, I would to hazard a guess, majority of you in this room are entrepreneurs. So we said, can we harness the, 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 the energy and the enterprise of entrepreneurs and get them to actually set up scalable, sustainable skill development initiatives. And then when we started down this process, we asked ourselves the question, are there 150 million jobs? I mean, when you're, is there a demand supply gap? So we then found that the best way to do it was to get some external people to do the numbers. And we got external consulting company to actually look at 20 sectors. We were skeptical, you know, 20 sectors, 150 million jobs, is not going to happen. So for good measure, we added the unorganized sector. When we added the unorganized sector and when these results came out and they're available on our website, we found that if these 20 sectors were to grow that the way they were projecting to grow, and for those of you who may have forgotten, I doubt very much, but 2008 was the height of the recession. So most industry projections were not very, you know, uh, optimistic and it was, you know, not gloomy, they were doom, doomed, like you know, everything's going to end tomorrow and the world is going to end at 2012 kind of thing. So we were surprised by the numbers. The numbers came out that these 20 sectors required 244 million people uh, between 2008 and 2022. So then the question was that we asked these guys, will you employ them? They said, we don't have any people to employ, but because people are not available, our investment strategy and other things are actually moving contrary to employing such a large number uh, because we're investing much more in capital and other things like that. And then I'm sure Manish will talk about it. The whole ecosystem is not conducive to actually employing people. So the whole ecosystem was also against that. Then very recently, we did a study on the infrastructure sector because in the 12th plan, uh, they were going to invest a trillion dollars in infrastructure. And we said, hey, you know, what's the need for infrastructure? And when we, this time we said, we're not going to ask a regular people and you know, we were saying get an international consultant to do it. So we got an international consulting organization to do it and they came up with the figure of 103 million. So if we just do a summation in 22 sectors of the economy, about 344 million jobs uh, are available in the next, uh, you know, between 2010 and 2022. So then came the challenge of how do you prepare people from it and how do you get people in a sustainable manner. So we then chose the thing that we will do three things. We will create the vision. So the moment the demand supply gap was there, I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs got interested. Then we found that the people required patient funding in this. And we said, OK, uh, we will go back to the old development funding model of uh, the ICICI bank or IDBI bank where they gave you know, loans at reduced interest rates. We chose a figure six, three to four year monitoriums, 10 year repayment period. And then we did some more numbers and we found that the problem is that uh, the government system cannot execute. Sorry, Manish, I'm boring your line. Apologies. 
uh, the, the private sector has a lack of trust and the NGOs have a lack of scale. So we said, how do we actually push the scale issue and how do we reduce cost and build trust? So you said you've got to do 100,000 people over 10 years, 70% of them have to earn a livelihood, be it getting a job or becoming an entrepreneur. And the certification should be such that it has been done by an independent body which is industry recognized, industry formed, and uh, it has to be sustainable. So this is not a grant model. When we started down this road, it was pretty tough. Uh, we, were, uh, we never knew what the response would be. But we said, you know, if you're asking entrepreneurs to give a 10-year plan, why does the NSDC create a 10-year plan? So we had a 10-year plan. We said we'll do three proposals, the first, uh, the pilot. The next year we do 25. Last year we said we'll do 32. This year we want to do 44, or 42 actually. Uh, you know, what has actually ended up is that we got the 25 in the first year. We got 32 to the board. Uh, last year, that is the 31st March, uh, some have been deferred to the next board meeting. And we are fairly confident that we'll get 42 this year. So if you recall, I said the training capacity was 3.1 million. The numbers that have come up from these 52 odd entities that we have approved and the 24 that have actually started, is that they would at the end of their investment phase have a capacity of about 11.3 million in skill over the 10 year period or by 2022 roughly about 68.8 million people. And most of the people are on track in the first year. Some, of course, have had other challenges. Uh, but I think uh, what they are not, they, what they are not finding is that there are no jobs. The biggest challenge is that they have to actually create an aspirational value in a large section of society to be able to get skilled and take a job. So I think now the challenge is how to fill the classroom, uh, not how to uh, service the needs uh, of uh, industry. Uh, and I think the, that this can be sustainable, uh, this can get return on investment, that there is no one model, that scale is essential, has actually been proved at least about 30 times over. So I'd like to just give that uh, overview uh, for you and then take it on from there. Thank you, Dilip. Uh, I'd like to now invite Manish to speak about it. Manish has a unique distinction that he, he uh, as his chief of team leads, he is on the demand side as well as he is on the supply side. So we are looking forward to your perspectives and your inputs on this, Manish. Over to you. Yeah. Can, I, can I give a disclaimer actually? Yeah. I need to give this disclaimer. I think uh, uh, all the three uh, on the dais other than me have been funded by NSDC. So I think that disclaimer I need to make, you know, sorry. Thought I should have. So over to you, Manish. So I, I work. I'm at the exit gate of the system primarily. I, I work for a people supply chain company. We've we've hired somebody every five minutes for the last five years, but we've only hired five percent of the kids who came to us for a job. So unemployability is clearly um, a bigger problem than unemployment. We have ten thousand open positions every day. We can't fill, and and we get thirty-five thousand or forty thousand kids who come to us every month. We hired about three or four thousand of them. So I, it wasn't as apparent to me, but it now is that the two most important decisions a child in India makes are to choose your parents wisely and to choose your PIN code wisely. I obviously did that, but there are five transitions going on, which is why these two decisions become important. Then there are journeys to a better life for most Indians. I think most of us, even the most bigoted free market people like me, are acknowledging that you know poverty. Growth doesn't necessarily lead to poverty reduction. And poverty reduction needs access. Access comes from the three E's of education, employment, and employability. And there are five transitions going on. Farm to non-farm, 58% of our people produce 15% of our GDP. Rural to urban, we only have 34 cities with more than a million people. China has 200. We have 600,000 villages. 200,000 of those villages have less than 200 people. Where will job creation be? Self-employment. Subsistence self-employment to wage employment. 50% of India is self-employed. Uh, that's not a badge of some overweighted entrepreneurial gene among Indians. The poor cannot afford to be unemployed, so they are self-employed, and they're mostly working poor. The school to work is, is obvious. I think one million kids will join the labor force every month for the next 20 years. So that's, that's um, many of them don't have, are not what they say they are in person on paper. 
and unorganized so organized 90 percent of India is still in the informal sector so four labor market variables being exactly where they were in 1991 12 percent manufacturing employment 58 percent agricultural employment 50 percent self-employment and 90 percent informal employment are sort of the unfinished agenda of reforms so from my perspective or vantage there's a the crux of the problem is there is a market failure in skill development See, employers are not willing to pay for training or candidates, they're willing to pay for trained candidates. Candidates are not willing to pay for training, they're willing to pay for a job. Banks for microfinance aren't willing to lend to the candidate unless a job is guaranteed. And training companies aren't able to fill up their classrooms. So the innovation lies at the intersection of employment and employability, and, and that's sort of an impossible trinity of cost, quality, and scale. And, and this is a uniquely India problem. You know, I'm, I'm sick and tired of presentations by you know, popcorn stands like New Zealand or Singapore or Germany on skill development, their entire output is a pilot by our standards. Um, India's scale is, is a little different. I'm not saying it's better, I'm just saying it's different. And we have to plan for that India's scale because we don't, we don't have the kind, we can't spend $10,000 a year like IT Singapore spends on, 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 on their students. The challenge fundamentally from a policy perspective which we struggle in the national skill mission is that you know this is a horizontal solution but the government is organized vertically so the solution the market is asking for and the employers parents kids are asking for is part ITI part college and part employment exchange they want the employability there but they also want the sig social signaling value of a degree and they do want an employer at the exit gate so I think that ch innovation which will be a different species um, it's it's not it doesn't exist right now in India and probably doesn't exist anywhere else on the scale that we need to is is what everybody is struggling with right now and this is going to take more time and more money than anybody thinks but I, but it's obviously the biggest entrepreneurial opportunity on the planet in the next 20 years I mean whether you take most people tend to focus on flow which is the 1 million kids but there are 300 million people of stock who will have to be changed what they're doing today or the only way they'll move out of poverty is if they improve their productivity. The only way they'll improve their productivity is if they get skilled. So. Thank you, Manish. Uh, you raised a few uh, issues about the scale and the, and the speed perhaps which was also came out in the earlier discussion. We'll pick up the questions a little later. Thank you for your insight. I'd like to invite their experiences thus far and also focus a little bit about affordability and accessibility uh, aspects of the whole thing. So over to you Sanjay. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks uh, Dilip and Manish for the wonderful context setting. Firstly before I start I think uh, for the benefit of the esteemed audience uh, let, let's understand uh, in terms of the overall opportunity that we keep talking about scaling in India demand and supply side and what are the few challenges as Manish just said. And I was told that yesterday we had almost about 300 entrepreneurs present in this hall. So I think it will uh, definitely be of interest uh, to most of them. In a very simple term the topic for this discussion that we are talking about reaping the demographic dividend in context of India. If we uh, look at uh, there are estimates very very uh, well established estimates which say that the supply side will be about 1.4 billion strong nation by 2025 and about 65 to 70 percent of this population will be in the working age group which is the whopping 900 odd million and out of that if you really look at uh, we say that there will be about at least 30 to 35 percent will be in the age group of 16 to 24 and which is the so called youth that we are talking about. There is a second uh, data point available which indicates that so far out of the entire working population age group in India only 5 percent of them have undergone a hands on practical work training. So if you heard the Lipar Manish saying that you know industry says there are jobs and they are not employable that is what I am referring to here. Whereas as compared to the developed countries this ratio of the formal work training is as high as about 60 to 90 percent. Now that is the kind of a gap that we are talking about and the opportunity that we are talking about. So if we are able to harness this demographic dividend and make this entire working age group 
really employable and actively contributing to the workforce. Perhaps India will have the 25 percent of the global workforce by 2025. And if one has to convert into simple numbers, our today's per capita income of 1000 US dollars will go to about 4100 US dollars by 2025. And at that level with our huge numbers, I think India is bound to be one of the most uh, you know, strongest economies in the world. Now, that is the kind of you know, opportunity and that is the kind of uh, interest of key stakeholders, be it industry, be it government and be it all of us that we uh, sort of have in this industry. Now, the question is that uh, how do we harness this and there are multiple challenges, but I think uh, first is I keep sharing on various forums that essentially perhaps today it is uh, a big marketing challenge for all of us as the key stakeholders. And when I say a uh, marketing challenge, I think first and foremost we need to redefine skills and education India and we need to establish it as the oil of uh, knowledge economy so to say and establish it as a global currency. What it means in terms of for the individuals or for the workforce or for the youth is essentially that it will help them in doing well, it will help them in keeping up with the global trends. For the industry, it will help them to be more productive, more efficient and also to be competitive as uh, they grow their businesses. And for the government goes without saying that it will be uh, sort of uh, you know the mandate of social inclusion, overall national uh, economic development and also creating many more taxpayers so to say. So, if we are able to redefine and position it as the real oil for knowledge economy which we have done perhaps you know in the area of IT, ITS over the last two decades, I am sure we will be able to harness and reap the maximum benefits out of this uh, demographic dividend that is in front of us. So, coming to uh, Murli's uh, one point that as NIIT we have had uh, you know I would say we were the pioneers in uh, uh, the skill industry so to say in India about 25 years ago to 30 years ago about three decades of experience in IT, ITS with a significant contribution to the IT sector, the skilling in the IT sector so to say. Over the last three, four years as an organization we have tried to leverage that and take us you know take ourselves from IT training company to a global talent uh, development organization and we have had multiple experiences you know not only in IT education for individuals, but schools, teachers, then management education, banking and finance and also worked with various state governments in uh, you know various areas be it MHRD, be it MORD or uh, be it uh, in the rural areas. As a foundation we have done uh, you know gone to the I would say larger section of the societies and having done all that we have realized that the next big leap that we need to take in the area of skills is uh, definitely in a joint partnership with government, with NSDC and the whole industry and our focus is going to be essentially on these two sides which we are talking about the youth and the service sectors. Service sector which is contributed about 50, 60 percent to our GDP and uh, that is where predominantly about 30 percent of the jobs that Dilip was talking about 300 odd million, all of that about 90 million jobs are going to be in service sector. That is on the supply side and demand when we are talking about a whopping about 280 to 300 million youths which will be ready during this period. So, how do we make it aspirational and then how do we take this forward that is what we are all going to work towards. Thank you. Thank you Sanjay. I think uh, a few things by now have been established. Uh, of course, people keep talking about India and China. So, from from scotch to skills, it is uh, India offers a huge opportunity for everybody. So, that is one thing that I think is very, very clear. The second thing which is very clear is also the fact that the, the, the supply today available it will not be able to meet the requirement of industry and will not be there contribute positively to the growth, the expectation from the industry is to be able to contribute to the GDP growth of the of the country. The third part of course, is the challenge in terms of the geographical dispersion, uh, where jobs are available and where people are available there is uh, there is a difference between the two and these are the challenges that people who are operating in this industry 
factory are uh, uh, facing. Now, just one uh, question. I'll just pick, ask a, our panelists a couple of questions, and then I'll throw the uh, floor open for uh, you to ask uh, our panelists. Uh, Dilip, uh, you spoke about the role that private sector would play. You spoke about the role that ministry and others are playing. Now, th there are a couple of key things that need to be done because it is also about social respectability for people because vocational education the previous speaker spoke about the fact that we need to be uh, before our session started that there needs to be a social respectability there is a stigma attached to vocational education which we need to deal with. So, it is a multidisciplinary approach that needs to be done. So, apart from providing funding uh, getting the industry on the table getting the people who will set up infrastructure for training on the table. What do you think are the two, three other things that need to be done in order to scale up in the next few years? You know, like I mentioned, that the biggest uh, challenge was a mindset challenge. Um, and I think the mindset is an industry. You know, it's surprising. The mindset is in private sector. Right? Uh, because of conditioning of 60 odd years. Uh, a normal HR person, if you were to employ anybody in some companies, even a pun, right, they would insist on a graduate. So, when the British actually set up our education system, they said that, you know, we need a class of people who will intermediate between the British and the people of India and they need to be, have graduates and etc, etc. So, somehow everybody has linked that, you know, if you are a graduate, you will get a job. And therefore, if you did anything else that did not lead to a degree, you were second class, you know, you were not there. And that is the fundamental kind of shift, uh, you know, which we need to do. So, if, if I were to try and, you know, put it in one line is how do we move the mindset from degrees without jobs to jobs without, without degrees. degrees. You know, that is the way, you know, we have to actually uh, do that. And the, se the second thing is that because we are unorganized, because uh, there are different challenges for the organized sector, how do we organize the un unorganized in a manner that the organized people actually get greater access to information where the jobs are, where the opportunities are, where the, you know, how do you organize plumbers, how do you organize painters, how do you organize carpenters, uh, you know. It is actually a dot com opportunity and I am quite surprised why it is, is not, uh, not happening. So, that is the second kind of thing. When you see the success stories come out, I mean you saw the, uh, the plumbing story and what actually he, uh, he did not share with you, actually the initial batch was 10 people, 3 dropped out which is typical of any batch. So, 30 percent of any vocational, uh, but when uh, you know I do not know why, but those of you who are following the video closely you would have seen that I gave away the certificates and you know I do not know why they did that. But I asked the three women why they had dropped out. They said no we have not dropped out we are going to rejoin the course. Because they saw the recognition being given to these seven other people. We do not tend to recognize, we do not tend to reward, we do not tend to appreciate drivers, we do not tend to appreciate shop floor workers. And it is not a developing country problem alone you know. The Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore actually went public at an industry meet and said you are not recognizing the blue collar workforce. And if you do not do that we are going to have a shortage of blue collar. So, this aspirational thing and industry yeah. leadership in changing industry structures recognizing that you need to pay more for skilled people. If industry does three things sorry I am taking but no, this is three things. We will only employ certified people. We will pay more for certified people than non certified people. And we would give training organizations who deliver people who can work in our organizations and are work ready first day, first hour or improve productivity by x percent. We would give them one month's salary as a, as a kind of thing and we would reward the person uh, after six months that he has been with us. It will just transform the thing. It is no, it's very simple you know sometimes the simplest things are the most difficult to do, but it requires a change of mindset across the entire stakeholders. Uh, it also requires a, uh, you know a mindset that if they are not you know 200 million jobs in 2022 for graduates, then do we actually create a capacity to have more than 200 million graduates or we take the Singapore and Finland route and say 
that you know only the X percentage of the top end will actually go on to graduates, the others will go on there. There are some decisions and choices we need to take, need but that's the challenge. I need to disagree with Dilip on two things. Um, one is yeah, sure. the social stigma. Um, the social stigma was rational for vocational training if it didn't lead to a job or it didn't have a corridor. I think if it leads to a job, a lot of the social stigma goes away. And the other is you need to create a corridor between a three-month certificate, a one-year diploma, a two-year associate degree, and a three-year degree. Only 30% of people may actually go on all the at, at every stage, they may only 30% may go up the ladder. But the fact that it was a dead end, you know, the apartheid created by the ayatollahs of education sitting in Delhi where there's a sort of partition, a very hard partition between training and education actually contributed to the social stigma. And hopefully NVQF and the sector skill councils which they're working on will change that. So I think if we start getting jobs and if we start creating the corridors, a lot of that social stigma will go away. I mean, you can spend money on advertising saying it's, it's nice to be <coughs> skilled, but I think those two are the key ones. And the other is this whole certification question. The problem may is not skill recognition, it is skill formation at this point in history. I mean, UK went through, in the 80s, they certified everybody, but you didn't do skill formation. So I would think that the signaling value of, of, of skills uh, certification is uh, important, and sometimes quantity, quality being sort of um, objective. Today there is a situation where you're saying, well, yes, industry should only hire certified people, but today many people who have certificates don't have skills and many people who have um, certificates don't have skills and skills don't have certificates. <laughs> so I think that's going to change in the next four or five years, but today the signaling value, see, the si you can be like IITs and IIMs with tight entry gates or wide open exit gates, or you can be like the chartered accountant exam with wide open entry gates and tight exit gates. Vocational training op has had wide open entry gates yeah, and wide open exit, exit gates. gates. <laughs> so therefore, the signaling value was low. I think Manish, you're not, you're not contradicting me. You're only amplifying the thing. Okay. I said, yeah. which your first day, first hour employable by a company. That's the, if the employers certify and they certify yeah. only the basis of the employability in the right. company. Agreed. That's what, so I yeah, think you agreed. very nicely amplified it uh, okay. yeah, in a very good way. All right. Thanks, Manish. Just building on it, I think uh, what's uh, what's coming through also, there is a need for uh, social respectability so that more and more people take to it for many reasons, right. The other question I had to you Manish specifically since you operate in the interface between industry on one side and, and you are a within quotes uh, a training provider or education provider yourself. Now this apprenticeship, uh, if you look at the employment continuum, you know most of the advanced economies have this concept of apprenticeship. In India, of course, it is fairly outdated as of now, it is applicable only to manufacturing sector and a few um, professions like law, for example, or, or chartered accountants that you mentioned about. Now, do you, what is your take on the whole thing? Is there some work which requires to be done where the industry needs to look at apprenticeship as a mechanism? You spoke about skill formation, right? In some of the professions and in manufacturing, it is an extremely important component of skill formation, apprenticeship. So with your experience in India, what is your perspective and do you have any experience to share specific experience or instances? Well, I, I mean, I think the broader point is that there are five classrooms or five ways to do skill development. There's a small center, there's a big campus, there's a cloud campus, there's a satellite campus and there's an on the job campus. I think we have to sort of expand our mind to include all five campuses and legitimize all five campuses. Today, UGC does not allow you to give credit yes. for on the job training. Yep. They don't recognize prior learning as a part of that whole apartheid between training and education. But there's no question that we can explode the apprenticeship. Um, there's a stupid apprenticeship act written in 1961 because of we, why we have only 250,000 apprentices. You know, Japan has 10 million, Germany has 6 million apprentices and formal apprenticeships, learning by doing and learning while earning are a very powerful way of learning. There are 16 recommendations on the table pending with the Ministry of Law. I mean, everybody sort of has agreed and, and done with them. And that's sort of symbolic of, of uh, you know, the biggest challenge we have in skills is, or at least I spend, I spend 30 percent of my time on public policy. And the biggest question I have is, how do you get something done in government when everybody who matters in government agrees with you? You've got to think about that. <laughs> So apprenticeship okay. is, is obviously going to have to be legitimized, but there's some regulatory cholesterol which is, which is holding it's it back right now. Coming in the way. Okay. Thank you very much for your inputs. Now, we'd like the, I'd like to throw the floor open to the participants. There's a gentleman here. Can we organize a 
microphone. Yeah, thank you. I think in the interest of time, we just shout out because we can maybe. Yeah, we can. <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, please. Hi, Peter Taylor. I run a private equity firm in Europe. We own a, a vocational um, training business in Europe, which is primarily where the funding primarily comes from the parents of the students. The students, some students pay, some employers pay, but the fundamental funding mechanism is from parents. Where do you see the big funding opportunity to grow vocational training in India? Is it going to come from parents, students, employers, or, or government, or somewhere else? So you're asking a question, parents do play an important role. So our experience in who pays? Who pays? Yep. So who pays for the vocational education, right? Dilip. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think Dilip, since you've been working in this area, maybe you can give us an input. So uh, there's no one answer to it. Um, ideally, there are segments of society where the parents and the trainees can pay. There are segments of society which who have access to borrowing and they can do that. But if you look at a large segment of society, uh, they may not have access to borrowing nor access to funds. Uh, but as Manish said, if they see a job at the end of it, they're willing to forego future earnings to actually pay uh, you know, in the future for uh, uh, learning and getting a job. I think the job is very important. And therefore, you know, it's very easy to get the first type of people, a little more difficult to get the second variety. The last variety is the really difficult thing, and that's where, you know, uh, most training organizations need to have a suit connect, which connects with the jobs, and a soul connect, which connects with the people. So it's a suit and soul business. It's just not, you know, a pure business there. Would it be right to say that uh, if you're looking at payment part of it, uh, look at education loan system in many of the developed countries and I'm taking an example from a slightly different industry a uh, lot of industries like auto or durables have grown because of availability of loans and uh, accessibility of loans would that make a difference the financial institutions and uh, and other people who uh, loan out would that make a difference you know, to uh, I the think the, the, of, the, the uh, loan uh, loan issue in vocational training has got two fundamentally you know, mind change issues. First, they're typically 5,000 to 7,500, the majority of them. There's some which are large. So for larger vocational training loan for recognized institute, it's not a problem to get it. But the bulk is going to be 5,000, 7,500 in rural India. The banks don't have the reach. Uh, and I think it's a great business opportunity uh, for microfinance companies, uh, for other it's a huge market, and you can aggregate it through scalable training providers. So it's, you know, if you look at the skill value chain, and since there are entrepreneurs here, right from mobilization to assessment for in-gate assessment to training to placement to post-job placement, there is huge opportunity for technology interventions and huge opportunity for entrepreneurial inventions. So there could be a jobs exchange, there could be a content exchange, a equipment exchange, a mobilization exchange, a training exchange, anything. It's a, you know, it's uh, like it's a blue sky. Let me just add. Thank you, Dilip. Yeah. Uh, Hi, sorry. Just, just a minute. I'll come to you. So. Sure. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, um, my name is Vaidinathan, and I'm an entrepreneur in the education space and also a Sankal finalist. Uh, my question is to uh, take on a remark which was made by Sanjay, saying it's a big marketing challenge. But the entire education and training edifice, like uh, Manish mentioned, it's totally regulated by entities who all come and certify those institutions. And still what comes out is not usable. So I'm wondering, is it a big marketing challenge or truth in advertisement challenge? Well. Uh, uh, I will take that on only. Yeah, yeah, please. See, there are two dimensions to this. And uh, what Manish said is also right. Now, looking at the reality, uh, there are policy makers working on this and they will take several months or several years and that's going on in parallel. 
the day that happens it will only help in exploding as uh, Dilip was saying that once those policies etc and when we have a seamless education system like NV, QF and some, something like that. In the meantime also the life has to go on there is both demand and supply side and that demand and supply side in today's context or the limitations of the policy or the regulatory today that is what I was posing as a marketing challenge because that is the current scenario. So, when I say a marketing challenge it's very simple there is a customer and there is a demand. So, is there is a pull the answer is no. So, there is a consumer there is a customer who needs the jobs, but the fact is that for these kind of vocational trainings there is no pull. Now, how do we really create that and all the stakeholders one is whether it is a social stigma or you know we drive through the industry and as Dilip rightly said very simple things need to be done. The moment industry helps us in this and then definitely we can also increase the consumer pull segment and that is all if we can do that. Then despite what are the current uh, you know the regulatory or the policy restrictions still it is a large enough pie that is what I meant by the marketing I challenge. I had warned you about a panel I members just, so I just want Dilip to say, over to you. I just want to say that there is no regulatory challenge in the vocational space or the type of people industry want. You take a management school, I will give you the example of ISP, they are not regulated, government may want to regulate them, right. Uh, if you take engineering management schools, you have the Warwick Center in Calcutta. So, if you can get an excellence model and if you can deliver to industry and the vocational space is not at all regulated, you know, uh, there is no, there's, so you can actually do it. Thank you for clarifying Dilip. Yes, sir. I will come to you too later please. Uh, my name is Ganesh, uh, I run an organization called uh, Easy Vidya, uh, yeah. again a Sankal finalist. Uh, I am more talking from a schooling sector perspective, uh, when we go around the classes and ask them what do you want to become, it is always an engineer or a doctor, neither a plumber electrician nor a teacher as well. Correct. So, uh, I think uh, the mindset starts from the schooling sector where if they feel that they are failing in all subjects, oh God I will have to become a carpenter, electrician or a plumber. So, this is one side. So, just a question to the panelists itself that are we looking at nurturing the input side itself? Uh, are we looking at the product who will get into the training? Is it a failure from a schooling dropout who will get into the training or can we nurture the students right from the beginning? That is one. The second comment I have on the lighter side is uh, I am from Chennai. There is a plumber who charges 600 rupees per hour and uh, he comes only through appointment and he gives a warranty card for 6 months for what he has repaired. And he is in great demand actually and he can be a great aspiration value for somebody like me who can become a plumber now. So, how where I mean I am seeing a disconnect in terms of how do we intervene at the school level and look at getting this aspiration value that is a general. So, uh, to you know first of all just to go back K 12 and higher education may be regulated, but if you want to take schools and expose them to vocational training. You know, you are from Chennai. So, if you look at Kids Central, right? Kids Central takes their kids to bakeries, to book binding institutes, you know, to other things. There was a nice presentation uh, earlier in one of the things about a company called Edge Sport, how they get sport and teach them. So, it is, you know, you develop motor skills and things there. So, that is very important. In fact, if you see Australia and if you see UK, you know, we went to World Skills. World Skills is a competition in London. But who they did not get college students and they got the age group from 7, 8, 9, 10 because they wanted to change their mindset. So, it is very important to do that. The global examples, the skills one in Australia, you know, but that is if we can do that and we can change the mindset there. And the other thing about why do people want to become engineers, doctors, etcetera, because that is the only information that they have. So, there is the information asymmetry there if and you know if you can clear the information asymmetry then we will be able to change the mindset. Just to add Thank to that I think it is uh, very relevant and that is where the NVQEF framework I mean what essentially talks about is that right at the schools itself you know you start sharing because there is a huge information arbitrage today between the upcountry and the schools and with that kind of an uh, target audience. So, if within the same school imagine if there is you know information available on various skills and the service sector then slowly it will start. Uh, and you know, it is given respectability and aspirational yes, value right. to other means and I think that is right. the answer. Uh, we are running out of time. So, we will just take the last two three questions. Yep. So, gentlemen here please. Yep. Okay, please. Hi. Uh, I have a quick question about the when you are talking about the legitimacy given through certification process. I am like is that really needed because 
from what I've noticed, uh, I live in Gurgaon and there we, uh, I can tell you, my the plumber I go to and the electrician I go to, when I uh, went to this guy's place, I realized that there were around 10 guys working with him and they were working as apprentices only as you were mentioned and uh, he was charging 25,000 rupees in a year to each of them. They were coming from villages, learning and then becoming plumbers or electricians themselves. So they, uh, these things are already happening. I guess market is the one, one, market should be the one which should be giving legitimacy to vocational education. So why we are talking yeah, so much yeah. about certifications? Maybe we should try to figure out how we can scale up these initiatives of how to in institutionalize such people who are doing this thing already in the market everywhere. Yeah, so, so you're right. I'd let, let uh, Manish you, take uh, the how question. How, how do you scale that up? See, I think there are three problems in the labor market. There's a matching problem which is connecting demand and supply. There's a mismatch problem which is repairing supply for demand. And there's a pipeline problem which is preparing supply for demand. Don't underestimate the matching problem. The Nobel Prize in Economics went to Peter Diamond this year for his work in search costs of labor markets. I would urge you to think about that because the 1400 employment exchanges this year gave only 3 lakh jobs to the 4 crore people registered. So matching costs are very high. Yes, Gurgaon is a cluster and there may be some efficiencies which have developed. But if you take the 5400 villages and cities and towns, if you take the 6 lakh villages, search costs are quite difficult and certification is a part of reducing search costs. Yeah. Thank you Manish. Yeah, the gentleman here and then we'll... Hi, uh, my name is Shahzad. Uh, I'm yeah. working on an initiative called Gyan, uh, which is uh, uh, in, in, in the area of career guidance, career counseling. Uh, I wanted to bring uh, two, uh, two, three points uh, uh, to the yeah, floor. Uh, and one thing is, uh, uh, since we are, uh, India is uh, large in number, so we have Sorry, Shahzad, you had a question or yeah. you had a, yeah. It, th that will actually a question also. Yeah, I mean, yeah. please. So uh, one thing is that uh, uh, we are not uh, focusing on career uh, we are just talking about creating creation of job and some people getting to you know some some kind of work at the end of the day you know whenever they can't get out of the college but what is happening is i'm coming from a corporate side also corporate world i work but people are not actually engaged with the work because they are not uh, they are not gone into the career which they sh they are probably meant for so because of this number game probably we are ignoring the imp very important fact of that uh, everyone uh, you know the passion which they have worked uh, about, I mean, or the, the passion which the people carry, they are not able to enter into the work, so something like that. So I don't know, I mean… You are talking about assessment of a person, of his uh, potential or what, which are the areas where he will be able to do that. Anyway, I would like Manish to take the… I don't understand the question. Yeah. So, so if so you can so the uh, frame the question, yeah. please. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll let, let, me try and, let me try and answer that in a short of time. So one of the issues is that most people aspire to jobs which don't have the ability to do that. And there's no person to actually tell the person that, you know, you might aspire to be an IT engineer, but you don't have the aptitude or skills or knowledge to do that. And even in the best training organizations, you can't do it. And that's precisely an opportunity in the skill space for organizations to come up who do that, both at the entry gate and exit gate. Uh, and more than just engineer yeah. in this, the labor market is quite sophisticated yeah. now. Feet on street, financial services, liabilities, yeah. Barclays pays me 23,000 and IDB pays me 6,000. For a kid the same age and the same job description, or retail floor supervisor, Bose will pay me 42,000 and Reliance will pay 8,000. The kid is the same age. Now, the difference may be English, it may be body odor, it may be many things which can be fixed. I'm not, I'm not saying in a contemptuous way, I'm just saying that those are two different destinies and the challenge we have is everybody wants to go to, everybody can't go to Barclays. But you know, if you start at IDBI, you might end up there. So I think that that career counseling and that corridor effect, which is 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 starting to happen in the Indian labour market, is 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 quite a good development. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to. Uh, yes. I'll just request for one minute. Okay, the so last. My, positively, my the last. The panelists have I'm, to go I'm for. I am Mahendra Kumar, minute. Chief General Manager, Nabard, looking yeah. after non-farm sector. And my dilemma is that uh, we are spending crores of rupees on what is skill building. And uh, we are spending for rural entrepreneurship development programs, we are spending for skill development initiatives, we are spending for marketing and quite a lot of other programs. In the last 10 years, we might have spent crores of rupees on this. So my dilemma is you know, whether the focus should be on the entrepreneurship development programs for a short program or skill development. Because what is happening after training 4 lakh people in the last few years, we are finding that uh, the type of results which we are looking for as an organization, they are not coming. So could you be kind enough to just sort out yeah. to some I'll extent quest, what, I sh what should uh, be my focus? So direct the question to Dilip. Yeah? So the, the two things, one is we need to move from supply side to demand side. So what's the demand side? 
second is not an is not either or it's both and we, we need to be able to find out those people who have an entrepreneurial ability Sorry. and aspiration and lead them down that to get local jobs for local people and local entrepreneurial opportunities mobile phone repair etc is are some examples and the others who actually aspire for jobs and you know are more secure in that not everybody has got an entrepreneurial knack so it's not it's not a very clear answer but we need more interventions to do it. definitely it has to be demand led it has to be outcome focused uh, and it's not either or is both yeah it's both i fully agree with you those areas we are also familiar but what is happening at the uh, at the output level what we are finding things are not going in that direction yeah because exactly. most of the programs that the government is supporting are uh, are grant based models so there was no skin in the game for the entrepreneur and therefore nsdc chose to go for a loan based model where you have a skin in the game no, we are coming with that policy this year now yeah, yeah. No. thank you very much for Excuse one last point please i Sorry, I, uh, I, I, we all have yeah, we all have the, to be in other you know, places. i have already finished the one panelists i'll finish and i think she's uh, <laughs> Uh, we'll correct you, afterwards now it's only to create more uh, training institutes in the rural areas uh, that is what is needed it is presently it is itis and other yeah. institutions the totally results, are, uh, so, results so, are not so adequate. nsdc just to so answer that is maybe not, ppp or something is not nsdc is not an urban centric organization but sir, have, still there is a big dearth one minute yeah, one minute there are, there are 529 one type of institutions and uh, and 2000 other type of institutions which are spread over 330 districts as we speak manish talked about the training capacity deficit right That's we have right. to increase that yeah yeah i agree i think the sorry, thread has to be there we will have to stop I, this discussion i'm so sorry for having to cut you off sir but uh, i think it's this is a topic that can go on and on so we have okay. limited so time over thank you murli a uh, uh, quick token of our appreciation to our panelists quite a fascinating discussion thank you manish dilip and yeah. sanjay for spending your valuable time with us um just a moment we request you to stay back for the launch of our human resources report access to capital and human resources are top two challenges the social entrepre entrepreneurs and enterprises face our report on human resource challenges in the indian social enterprise sector covers challenges from recruiting capacity building retaining talent and building teams that drive scale i call upon prajita agarwal co-founder of intellicap to share the report with our panelists and request them to launch the same Thank you. We will be distributing uh, the report via our PDF downloadable links, which will be available via e-shots as well as on our websites. We're trying to be environmentally friendly people. Um, while planning for this panel, we were keen to have the Honorable Minister of State for Commerce and IT, Mr. Milind Deora, as a Millennial Generation representative. While his travel schedule did not permit him to join us today, he has sent a personalized message to be shared with the Sankalp community. Quote, it gives me immense pleasure to know that Intellicap and the Sankalp Forum is organizing the fourth annual Sankalp en Social Enterprise and Investment Forum today on 13th April. It is heartening to note that previous summits organized by the Sankalp Forum were attended by renowned dignitaries. I am happy that the Sankal Summit is one of Asia's premier platforms for businesses that address challenges of inclusive growth by providing access to affordable services and better livelihood opportunities to the underserved and that it helps businesses achieve scale through funding and market linkages by connecting them to investors, policy makers, industry experts and other enablers. It is worth mentioning here that the effort put in by the Sankalp Forum helped to develop a well-knitted synergy between grassroots level entrepreneurs and the international players in the field of business, economics and investment spheres. I wish the summit a great success. Unquote.